Praise the Lord. I'm here to talk to you this morning about the mirror image of Jesus. The mirror image of Jesus Christ. And we'll be looking at a man who is the greatest man in history other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm sure you know who that is then. His name is John the Baptist. We'll take for a reading from Luke 7, verse 24. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ's testimony of John I'm reading here. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man uh, clothed in soft garments. Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptised with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptised by him. And that's the reading from Luke chapter 7 of God's holy word. Father, I pray that your name will be honoured, that your name will be glorified, that your name will be known, and that you will be extolled and exalted and made very high in our sight for the glory and honour of your name alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John the Baptist is like a mirror image of the Lord Jesus Christ. They both had a supernatural birth announced by an angel. They were both, in fact, named by an angel, the same angel, Gabriel. And Zechariah and Elizabeth were well stricken in years and could not conceive a child naturally. But an angel came and announced the miracle birth of the forerunner of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. More than a prophet... In what way? Well, we'll look at the mirror images here and then we'll look at a few other reasons why he is not just a prophet, but he is, in the words of Christ, more than a prophet. So, John's supernatural birth mirrored Christ's naming uh, by the angel Gabriel, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And you shall call his name John, the angel said. Then when the children met, and they met, as it were, supernaturally while in the womb, the Spirit of God filled Elizabeth when Mary greeted her. And John the Baptist was filled, it says, from his mother's womb. And Mary received a prophecy from Zechariah about the fruit of her womb, the Christ. And here you have John and Jesus united in a supernatural birth. Now John filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Talk about a supernatural birth. And then when the children were born, the Lord Jesus was prophesied over by um Simeon and um, 
Anna the prophetess. And when John was born, his father's tongue was loosed and he prophesied and spoke a prophecy of the glorious things that John would do in God. Then, as they grew up as family, that's another thing that unites them. These were cousins and I don't know if they grew up together. I haven't found that in the Old Testament or in the New so far. It may be there in the Old, in the prophetic symbolisms. But we know that they were um, family. And of course, John would suffer grave tragedy with his mum and dad probably dying while he was quite young because they were already very old when they gave birth to him. And of course, when my father and mother forsake me, the scripture says, then the Lord will take me up. And John, at some point, and I'm not sure when, went to live in the wilderness. And he had a diet there of locusts and wild honey. And of course, locusts symbolizing satanic powers. And John would have them for breakfast. He wouldn't give in to temptation. He wouldn't live a life of carnality and ease, as Jesus highlighted when he said about the kings living in luxury and about a reed shaken by the wind. This man was not all over the place spiritually. And of course he had wild honey, which speaks of the victory, the sweetest place in life is where the enemy falls before you. John had victory over Satan in that wilderness, just like Christ gained the victory in the wilderness when he was uh, beginning his ministry. And they both preached the same message, the words of John the Baptist, repent, and the words of Christ, his first sermon, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They both never married. Now, there is other things that bring John into an exclusive role in the scriptures. Why is he more than a prophet? He is more than a prophet on a couple of lines, and perhaps a lot more of other ways that I don't know or understand yet. And I hope... In That you may fill me in if anyone else knows how John was more than a prophet. What Jesus meant by this utterance. But John was the prophet who was prophesied. Just like the scriptures predicted Messiah and his coming and his glorious appearing and his sacrificial atoning death and his ascension and his resurrection and all of the glorious kingdom that would be made in the new creation. So John the Baptist finds the prophets of old writing about him. Jesus himself says, this is he of whom it is written. Wow. It was written about this man. Not in just one place. That was Malachi 3. The Lord Jesus quoted verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger before your face. But also, it was Isaiah. Remember, they went to John the Baptist and he was so much like Christ. They said, are you the prophet? Which referred to the scriptures where it said of Moses prophesied that the Lord our God will raise up a prophet like unto Moses. Whom you will hear in all things and anyone who will not hear that prophet will be cut off from among the people. So this was the prophet that they were waiting on that Moses had predicted that would be like him. And yet they said to John, are you the prophet? Now, the true prophet was the Lord Jesus Christ referred to in that. But they thought he was so much like a Moses figure that they said, are you him? No. They said, are you Elijah? No. They said, even, I think in another place, are you the Christ? He was so much like Christ, they thought he he could be the Christ. Now, he's also prophesied, he said, well, who are you then? And it was also written of him. And John knew it was written of him. By revelation he knew. And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And if you read on in that prophecy, it says every hill will be, every valley will be exalted and every hill made low and every crooked place straight and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And we know that was the Christ. And John knew this. He was also, some say, even though he denied when it was asked of him, are you Elijah? He said no. But then Malachi 4, it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. 
uh, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And Jesus, when he talked about John the Baptist, when the apostles came down from the Mount of Transfiguration with him, the three, and they said, how is it that they say Elijah must come first? And he said, Elijah has come already and they did to him whatever they wanted. And he was speaking of John. And they understood then he was speaking of John the Baptist. So Jesus referred to him as the Elijah, which was for to come, it says, which gives an idea of a double fulfillment that there may be this type of ministry at the end before his final appearing. But we won't get into that. Um, indeed, I'm very ignorant in the, the topic of the future glory, unfortunately. Um, but here we have Elijah. Here we have a man prophesied. The scriptures were written about this man. The, the prophets are prophesying of Christ. But this man is so like Christ that the prophets are writing about this man. This man is the mirror image of Jesus. This man looks like him in family. Looks like him in birth. Looks like him in lifestyle. Looks like him in the way he lived apart from sin and un separated unto the gospel. This man was more than a prophet. And Jesus mentions this again in Matthew. I read the Luke one there, but let's hear the Matthew testimony. As he departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Now here is an additional statement that Jesus makes of John. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He is Elijah who is to come. And it says of John. Jesus said, all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. Why is he more than a prophet? Here's another reason. One, it was written of him. Not just written of Christ. He was the one who it was written of. And then, secondarily, why is he more than a prophet? The, John saw the Lord Jesus Christ walking towards him. He pointed him to him. He pointed people to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All the prophets of Scripture pointed forward to Messiah. John the Baptist spoke of Messiah, but he was the only one who prophesied it and saw him come. He saw the fulfilling of all of the law and the prophets before his very eyes. He saw the Christ. He was the only man in Israel declaring this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was a divine revelation of the Christ. And he knew him. And he then saw him. He didn't just predict him and die in hope. He's not like us looking back, remembering the precious blood and the body and the ministry of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. He's not like Isaiah predicting the suffering servant who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for iniquities and dying without seeing him. He saw the Lord. He saw him with his own eyes. He declared him the Messiah. He declared him the Lamb of God. He declared him the one who is greater than him. And when Jesus came to be baptized with him, this is the gospel already declared in the very first event that they unite in. These are gospel men. These are the Christ, of course, is 
the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. He is the gospel. His death, his life, his resurrection, his ascension. Christ brings good news. He is good news and he's the only news that you will ever need. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to him and John the Baptist recognises him and said, I have need to be baptised of you and are you coming to me? And the Lord Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now to fulfil all righteousness. And then they fulfil all righteousness and assemble before all of those people who had come out to the wilderness. John baptised the Son of God in water. They went down into the Jordan. They came up and God the Father sent the Holy Spirit upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And with his voice he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God only speaks from heaven in the Scriptures out loud in relation to the Gospel. He always testifies of his Son and his death and resurrection. And so Jesus, when he went down into those waters in the Jordan, he was symbolizing his own death, the way to fulfill all righteousness, the death of Christ. And then he was raised for our justification. Up he came out of those waters symbolizing his own death to newness of life and the symbol of baptism and the resurrection power. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. In that very baptism he already knew he would die, he would rise from the dead and that after that the Holy Ghost would be given from heaven and descended on his body. It happened in Acts, it was fulfilled that he had died, he had been resurrected, he had ascended and then the Holy Spirit was put upon the church in Acts chapter 2 and we have the symbolism here very clearly of Elijah walking through the Jordan and striking the Jordan with his mantle and the waters parting he went down into death he came up in newness of life representing John the Baptist that Elijah and then so much like Christ was Elijah that he was used to symbolize the ascension and he was taken up do you remember with a whirlwind but then Elisha, representing the full earthly ministry of Jesus, comes back to that Jordan and does the very same act, striking the water down into death, up in newness of life. Those two men, Elisha and Elijah at the Jordan, were symbolizing the true fulfillment of it when John the Baptist and Jesus would unite as one man, down into death, in the burial. Do you know what it says of us? We're meant to be identified here with John the Baptist. You know, that we are with Christ at the baptism. It says, reckon yourselves crucified with Christ, buried with him in baptism. You see, this symbol is to fulfill all righteousness. We are bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And John literally was his relative in that situation. So this is John. Rather than go on too long, look at how much his life is like the life of the Lord Jesus. In every aspect you look at it, he is almost the fullness of the stature of Christ in a man. The greatest that any man attained to Christ-likeness in the land of the living, in this life, in this world. But Jesus says something so profound. I say to you, Luke seven twenty eight: among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Okay, if it ends there, it's wonderful. And here's an, an even more amazing statement. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When you looked at John, you saw someone who was just like Jesus. And yet... We think those promises are for John, the scriptures testified of him, the supernatural birth, the filling of the Holy Ghost, the testifying of the Lamb of God, the persecution, the sufferings in this life that was filling up the sufferings of Christ in his body, you know, as Paul said, I fill up the sufferings of Christ in my flesh. But I say to you, who are in the kingdom of God, even if you're the very least, the Worst saint of all the ages who is a saint. 
that you are greater than he. On that day, the Bible says, when we see him, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. If you think John was like Jesus, you are going to be more like Jesus. If you think these supernatural wonders were just for the, the, the John the Baptist of this world, the Elijahs and the Elishas, the Bible says that you have a supernatural birth. You're born again of the Spirit of God. Of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. You have a supernatural birth. It's prophesied. You're written in the scriptures. Jesus declares in Hebrews, Behold I and the children God has given me. You're going to be a supernatural child of God. Never could it happen by a natural means, just like John couldn't be born by a natural means. Um, of his own will begat he us of the word of truth. And in John, of course, chapter 1, it says um, that we were begotten not of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Your life was testified of angels. It said that the law was given by the hands of angels. And it talks about that, Stephen's preach, it talks about that in Galatians. Check out the angelic declaration of the law. And you are guarded by angels. The angel of the Lord encamps around them that fear him and delivers them. You then have a supernatural baptism into the Holy Spirit. The power of God's Spirit that filled John the Baptist is the power of God's Spirit that can be given to his saints. And you shall enter into a physical death, just like Christ, just like John did. And you will experience a physical, bodily resurrection. You're going to have the most supernatural life, just like these men did. And you shall ascend on the day that he returns. It says, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we whom are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air. Look at the ascension you're going to be given. This is not happening to someone else. This is going to happen to you who are in Christ. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. And it says that he has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. We will be the mirror image of the Lord Jesus Christ on that day. Now, we want to please him in this life. We want to be as close as we can get in this life to the image of Christ. As John was. But we, even who are the least, will be translated into his likeness on that day. The Lord shall see the reward of his suffering and he shall be satisfied. Be encouraged about what you really are. And what you shall be. In Christ you shall inherit all things. I will be his father and he will be my son. It says in Revelation. And he will inherit all things. The gospel is such great news. We can hardly conceive of it. But I hath not seen, ear hath not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for them that love him. But he has revealed it to us by his spirit. To be in the likeness of Christ is greater than any of your wildest dreams coming true. To abide in Christ and with Christ throughout eternity is joy unspeakable and full of glory. John was commended not on a lot of different lines, but the line in which he was commended was his Christ likeness, a prophet. More than a prophet. Not a man shaken like a reed with the wind. Not a man living for this world's luxury. Have you found the sufferings of this life hard? John lost his parents. He lived in the wilderness. He suffered persecution. He was imprisoned in darkness. He was beheaded unjustly. He had a life of suffering. And Jesus said that was the best life that was ever lived by a human being. Because no matter what you're suffering... Is it sickness? Is it bereavement? Is it pain? Is it sadness? Is it the hardship of life? Fill up therefore in your flesh the sufferings of Christ. Because Christ will not command you just on those things. He will command you that you are born in the image of his son. You'll be commended on your Christ likeness. You please God because you have 
his son in you and you are formed, the new you, the born again you is in his image. And that is the greatest life that can ever be. And on that day, none of these sufferings will matter. On that day, we will have suffered for him, yes, but our suffering will come to an end. And all that will matter is that we are in his image and that we are the mirror image of the Son of God. For God to make less than an image of himself would be less than perfection, would be less than perfect wisdom. And we know that God alone is wise and that he has done all things well. John in the prison sent and said, are you the coming one or do we look for another? A lot of people think he doubted that he was Messiah, that doubted that he was right. It could be in human weakness, I'll be honest. A man who's not shaken like a reed, a man who's been living an austere holy life all of his days, does not fall apart in a prison. Paul didn't fall apart in the prison. I think... This is just my personal view that he was looking for the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Without that Lamb, John knew he was a priest. He was a Levite. And even though he wasn't in that temple, he was working in the true temple. And the priest always had to pick the spotless Lamb. And John the Baptist picked the Lamb of God. He said, there is the spotless Lamb. There is the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. That was his declaration under the priesthood of Levi. And now the true priest in the order of Melchizedek was to come and offer himself as a spotless offering to God by the power of an endless life. He was to be raised up to life after suffering death and causing death to die. But John was in that dark prison and Christ was ministering. Christ was healing and Christ told him that. He was raising the dead, he was healing the sick, he was cleansing the lepers. And this was all proof that he could absolve from sin because these healings couldn't happen if there was no atonement for people, no forgiveness, no restoration. But John had declared him the Lamb of God. John knew he had to go and he had to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He knew that his blood had to flow and atone for the sins of the world and pay for the disgusting sins of this world. And John had never seen that happen. He had not heard of it happening. And he said, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? And Jesus told him all the wonders, all the glories of his ministry. And he said, and blessed is he who's not offended in me. John didn't get to see the lamb die on the cross. But he knew he had seen the lamb. And we didn't see the Lamb die on the cross physically, but we know by the Spirit we have seen the Lamb of God. We know he was taken, that he was falsely accused, that he was whipped, that he was beaten, that he was spat upon, that his beard was plucked. We know that he was charged and nailed between two thieves on a rugged cross. And we know that he interceded for the transgressors on the cross, saying, Father, forgive them. And we know that he died there for our sins and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. So John was in the image of Christ. You are in the image of Christ. But we only enter into the crucifixion, the payment for sin in a symbol, in baptism. Dying to self, as it were, because we are the sin problem in the flesh. Only one man suffered For the sins of this world. Only one man can save us. Only one name given under heaven. Whereby we must be saved. And only one king of kings. And only one lord of lords. And only one justifier. Of sinners. John needed his forgiveness. We need his forgiveness. Thank God he doesn't just forgive us. He transforms us. Into the likeness of his son take comfort the hard days are nearly at an end look up your redemption draws nigh this wicked world will never hold us we're going to glory 
We're going to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We're going to see the Lamb of God alive and well. And we're going to fellowship with him in his image. And we'll be thankful forevermore. God bless each one of you. God keep each one of you. And God help each one of you. Amen.